Hey everyone, it's Jim from Vowels and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in tube lab number 89, we're going to do another episode on how to achieve great sound. And we're going to talk about phase. In particular, we're going to talk about phase inversion. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. Okay, we've taken a look at phase before, way back in tube lab number 64. I'll put a link below if you want to see a scope of a typical audio signal as it makes its way through a monoblock power amp. A scope is just a short, the short form uh, for an oscilloscope. Now you know why everybody calls it a scope. <laughs> okay, so let's just follow the signal chain from recording to your speakers quickly so that we can get kind of get oriented. So at the recording stage, everything is analog, right? But not long after that, when we're actually recording the music onto some kind of a medium, it can go on to tape, and some people still use tape, but most likely it's going to some sort of a digital recording device. Essentially, it's landing on a computer hard drive, right? And after that, we've got the mixing, the mastering, and the pressing stage. Pressing if we've got vinyl, and digital mastering if we're going digital. And these days, it can, you can cross back and forth. You can come from the analog domain to the digital domain and then back to analog and um, and either way, anyway. <laughs> it's the Wild West out there. So, um, and we've talked about source material in, in another tube lab. So you can look that up if you'd like as well. So from the recording stage, we nominally, let's say, Normally, we are going to be in phase, positive and negative, coming in, coming out, positive and negative, going to our source material, records, reel-to-reel -reel tapes, uh, digital music player. Most of you are probably streaming. So our music source is hopefully still in phase, right? Nominally, positive and negative. Now... We've got a left and a right channel. So the left and right channels have to be in phase, but we've got a nominal phase of the original recording, right? So we don't want that to be inverted at some point. Now, in some cases, when you're recording, let's say, a vocal and an instrument, you deliberately invert the vocal to the instrument. It just makes for a better presentation. And but in some cases, there is an accidental inversion in this whole process. And if that happens, it's going to end up way over here at your home system, and you may not know it, right? Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about inversion and whether it matters in a minute. Let's just follow the signal. Now, You've probably got a preamp and a power amp, but maybe you've got an integrated amp in which both these units are together. The Wilsonton R8 is a classic example of a modern integrated high-powered tube amp. So in comes our nominal positive signal. Now I didn't draw the left and right channels, but and these are this is a monoblock here, but let's just presume that. The left and right is moving together, right? Left, right, left, right. It's always it's always in phase. In the power amp, it comes across in phase. When we get to our speakers, now this is where it starts to get important to really pay attention. We've got a positive and negative post. Well, this is the positive phase. That's this right here. And this is the negative post. Negative, negative. Now, what's really critical that can muck things up really badly is if you invert one of the cable connections. Now there's four of them, right? There's two channels and there's a cable at each end. So if you were to invert one of them, you would immediately hear a dropout in bass and your center stereo image would 
evaporate and it would diffuse all over the place. So if you're fooling around with your system, a friend's system, or setting up a brand new one, and you sit down and you say, wow, it sounds like the bass has gone through one giant filter. <laughs> Where is my bass? Well, you probably have an inversion in one channel, right? So one channel is out of phase. Ah, okay. So I think everybody gets that. Now, what about if some of your equipment somewhere in here, either accidentally, deliberately, or through design, ends up inverting both channels? Ah, okay. So in my case, I have two kit preamps and uh, another, at least one more prototype. And they all invert the signal. So the signal comes in here nominally as positive and it gets inverted to nominally negative. And this would carry through to here and through to here. Now, does that mean I've destroyed the sound? No, it doesn't because I've inverted both channels, right? The left and right channel are inverted in parallel. So technically, you should not be able to hear a difference if both channels get inverted. Now, there was a great face book discussion, oh, I don't know, two, three years ago, in that went on for days. It went on for maybe a week in which the phase was discussed. People with a lot more knowledge about this, pro audio guys were in there, and they were, they were really going at it. <laughs> and at the end of the day, um, the, the basic uh, conclusion of the experts was, if you invert both channels, you shouldn't be able to hear a difference. But in some cases you can, especially uh, audiophiles who listen critically. Now, I'm going to show you a simple way to do some testing to see if in fact there is an inversion in your system that you're not aware of. Because not everybody has fairly simple equipment and almost nobody has a signal generator and a scope at home so that you can actually send a signal through your system and take a look to see whether or not your system inverts at some point. Okay, so let's get rid of the cards, as pretty as they are. <laughs> I'm not an artist, so um, hopefully you forgive my my poor drawings. Hang on. All right, so let's back up a little bit. This is the Yuri monoblock. Now it, it does not it takes the signal in and it sends it back out in the same phase orientation it arrived in. But in my case, I've got a preamp before it, right? That's feeding an inverted signal to both channels. So let me just grab some speaker cables here. So normally you're going to plug in right like this, right? And at the speaker end, you're going to be, let me grab the speaker card and let's see if I can get it oriented right. So normally, are you on camera? Yeah, you are. So normally it's going to be plugged in like this and Bob's your uncle. Everything should sound good. Now, part of setting up a system and discerning whether you've got a problem is critical listening. And if you want to explore phase, uh, do one a couple of simple tests. So the first test is going to be Listen to your system the way it's set up. Pick a track with some good bass, nice, clean, clear bass, not, you know, muddy, thump a thump -a stuff. Some good, good, clean bass. Sit down, listen to it. Don't change the volume. Don't do anything. Just listen to one track, back up the track, reset it, and go and reverse one connection at the amp. You can do it at the speaker. We're just going to do one, just one, not both channels, just one. Play the track over and listen. You will hear a heavily filtered bass, and that's because of cancellations. You're going to have an inverted signal, and you're going to be canceling it out. There's not enough time to, to draw the signals um, to show you how this works, but trust me on this, you'll hear it. This is the important thing. We're going this. This is really what we want to talk about: is how to listen for a problem with phase, right? Okay. So 
you got that. So now, put it back the way it was, sit down and listen to it again. Everything should be good. Now, if you want to know if there's a difference in how, um, how your system does with the phase orientation, or if the track maybe was accidentally inverted, or if possibly, if you have a more complex system, possibly you have a, a big powerful um, amplifier or preamplifier or some other piece of equipment in your chain, if somebody, some manufacturer has inverted the signal and not told you, go ahead at your amplifier or at your speakers, not both, one or the other, and invert both the left and right channels. Now, before you touch a speaker connection or any, um, any cable connection to your system, you're going to turn off, right? Everybody knows that. But I'm going to repeat it over and over again because with tube gear in particular, it's a great way to kill a vintage tube. It's to send a little voltage shock through the system and surprise a tube and damage the grid of the tube, most likely. It doesn't happen every time, but it only takes once to kill a good tube, right? So, you've inverted the left and the right channels. Now go ahead and listen to the same track. You probably don't hear any difference whatsoever. But if you do, then you can start to do more experiments. Go into more tracks and listen to see if the difference that you heard with that first track, in fact, holds up for other tracks. Now, the reason why you're going to have to do more tracks is because it's possible that that one particular song that you listened to first had accidentally had an inversion at a much earlier stage of production. And now you actually are hearing it in its correct phase orientation. Okay, so maybe this is a little bit too nuanced for, for most of you out there, but it's something that's well worth uh, spending a few minutes doing and just checking it out. And it'll get you comfortable with making sure that your phase is correctly oriented. Okay, what the heck is going on over at Melatone Kits? Well, I've got something fun to show you, so hang on, let's clear the decks again. Okay, so this is the, I think I have to back up a little bit. This is the prototype GU50 monoblock, which is going to be, I think our, our, um, our modeling showed that it would be just a hair under 10 watts in pure class A. 10 watts RMS, of course, and um, no phony baloney uh, specifications from me. Um, so there, and uh, someday we'll talk about how power ratings can be a bunch of BS. But anyways, so you may have noticed that the output transformer looks a lot like the one on the URI, and that's because it is the one on the URI. It is actually perfectly suited electrically for the circuit, and it's rated for 15 watts. So, and it, it sounds amazing on the URI. It's a very, very linear output transformer, and it drops way down into the low bass frequencies. So, um, it, I was really thrilled when I realized it was a good match, because it's one of the nicest sounding output transformers I've ever heard. So, why not, why not use it? Absolutely, let's use it. I was so glad. But over here, I've got a honking big power transformer. Well... That's because the GU50 uses much higher voltage. We're going to be running at just under 500 volts on the plate. And if you want higher voltage and more current, you need physically a larger piece of iron. And that's going to mean that this gets more expensive, but hopefully it means we have a higher powered um, Class A monoblock to add to the kit amps. And with a larger current capable power transformer, we should see some improvements in sound. So hopefully the money is well worth it. I actually could have gone with the next size down, but the uh, current rating of that 
power transformer was just marginally higher than what I needed and really when it comes to power supplies you want them overbuilt. Uh, that, that's a good path to great sound. So we have to accommodate a much heavier piece of iron but I think it's going to be worth it. It just fits. This is probably the largest amp you can get into um, our standard platform size. So this is where we're at. It looks like a big snarl of wires, um, but I have to leave most of the wires for the power transformer in place because I'm not 100% certain as to what I will need and won't need, so I'm certainly not cutting anything off until after I start to wire up the prototype and I get my voltages correct. At that point, I'll snip them back. Some of them are snipped back. You can see that they're, I don't, I didn't need, I think there's a, a 50 volt tap on the power transformer. I know I don't need that. So it's been snipped and capped. Um, and over here, we've got um, two different impedances. I probably know which, which tap I'm going to use, but again, I'm going to leave the wires in place. Here we've got uh, my standard universal power supply PCB and the board. These boards are wonderful. They're easy to put together. I, I put this together this morning in a span of a, a few minutes. They really solder up really quick. The one thing that's going to happen to our uh, stock of parts is that we're this amp, because we're going to be running higher than our normal voltages, we've got to restock uh, some fairly expensive capacitors. There's this one here. There's one large filter cap that'll go on the top. And I've got to get at least a 500 voltage rating uh, for these capacitors. So that'll be an expense. But it's got to be done because we're going to explore this amp and see what it sounds like. Here you can see I've labeled the GU50 socket. It's a beautiful ceramic socket, but I've really labeled it in detail because I'm going to have to come along and lay out the wiring and the electrical components, and it really helps visually to see, oh, okay, G1, that's your grid input. Oh, P, that's your plate. It'll really help me see so that I can quickly lay out how it's going to go because I want the best layout electrically and sonically, but I also need a layout that's practical for kid amp builders so that they can put the thing together fairly easily without getting into trouble. <laughs> Over here we're going to have, hang on, I've got a, a board here somewhere. I've got these, these PCBs all over the place. We're going to have a custom board for the Loctal socket. I've got a socket here too somewhere. Here's the Loctal socket. It's going to go like this. The board's going to fit like this. And this is going to be a two-stage gain stage to drive the GU50 to get it enough voltage to make this thing uh, work at peak efficiency. So these boards, um, we're working right now on designing them. The circuit's designed, but the uh, we've still got to complete the... I have to do one more proof check on the board design and because it costs a fortune to ship these boards from the manufacturer I have to put together a whole series of board orders so I have to design a number of boards. When the board finally comes in, the right board for this job, we'll have this all together and from this stage that we're at the amp actually goes together really quickly over here you might notice that there's another transformer and that is a little auxiliary 12 volt power transformer and that's because we need that because most power transformers have a 6 volt filament tap because most um, power amps are running 6 volt tubes. So here's the 6 volt that'll power up the Loctal over here most likely and the 12 volt filament transformer is for the GU50. It's a fairly unusual power tube that it uses 12 volts, but that's what it uses, so we need 12 volts. So that's this is actually not that big an expense. It took 
probably cost us more trying to figure out how to get it into the existing chassis. And then I figured out I could mount, if you can see, I mounted it actually on two bolts of the power transformer on the other side of it. And it fits in there really neatly. It's in exactly the right spot. So I was quite happy when I finally figured out how to get all of this oriented. And it's turned nicely. And remember, there's noise off of transformers on this end here. This is the shield and the bracket. But this has noise. This has noise. This doesn't. So you can see how it's oriented against the shield of the filter choke here. So that should be really a good spot for it. Anyways, this is why we build prototypes, because we don't know where the problems will be. We don't know if it's going to sound great. We hope it'll sound great. Um, so we build it. We get it working properly. We solve any little issues that we find or big issues. And then we get to finally sit down and do some critical listening. And that moment is such a glorious moment. And I always choose a special track for that first listen. Okay. Let's get this off the bench. And let's just grab some tubes. Now, this has actually been a fairly slow week. So we're going to look at, we're going to revisit this melts tube. And let's zoom in a little bit. I got a nice little pile of new old stock, NOS, new in the box, NIB, um, GE 6SN7 GTBs. Now, new old stock, new in the box tubes come and go periodically, some more often than others. In the, the, both of these cases, it's fairly unusual. I don't know why I don't find a lot of GEs new in the box, but I don't. I find a lot of used ones. And these are just beautiful tubes. This is one of my favorite tubes for um, the cathode follower. And I sell a lot of these to Yuri owners. Um, sorry, to um, Freya Plus owners. I got Yuri on the brain. Okay. Um, now, a whole bunch of these uh, melts, 6SL7, direct equivalents came in I and mean, I showed them off last week. They came new in the box and I've never seen them new in the box before. I've had some brand new ones in. Um, oh, a year or two ago I got in a whole bunch and they were beautiful tubes. The bases were perfect like this. Look, look at these. I mean, these are all, most of these are dated around 1956. So they're, um, they're 66 years old, I think. Um, anyways, uh, what I wanted to say is because these tubes tend 66, they're not 66 years old, Jimmy. They are 44 and 22. Yeah, they're 66 years old. Okay. Um, because these tubes are so damned expensive, when they come in, um, I always do a listening. I do electrical testing too first, uh, but I always do a listening test, and I I think the failure rate's roughly for a normal order, a mixed order of new old stock and used tubes. I think the failure rate is probably somewhere around a third. To 40 or 50 percent depending on the order I got I think I got 18 in this order and every single tube was perfect and that proves something I've thought for a long time that however these tubes these mil spec tubes are used in circuit has has in many cases has damaged the grid input that's the very sensitive part of almost any vacuum tube is the is that thin wire that gets wrapped around and the signal, the audio signal goes on to it. It's designed for low voltage, but if somebody puts a real shock through the system, either you're static charge accidentally, or they do something really dumb, like have the system up and running at high volume and they change a cable, who knows what happens? 
or it could just be that the military equipment that this these tubes were in in many cases is really challenging to the grid of the tube many of them get noisy so it was a real pleasure to listen to 18 brand new tubes and they were perfectly quiet <laughs> not a single one of them had a problem so I don't think it's the tube that's at fault. That's what I'm trying to say. I think it's how they were used, which is why I screen them so carefully. Every once in a while one gets through, because you know I can only play a tube in test conditions for so long, and then I gotta move on and test another tube, right? So sometimes customers will end up with a tube uh, like this, and it gets noisy a week after they get it. In which case, of course, I replace the tube. Okay, well, if you stayed the, till the very end, I got some discount codes to help you out. Now, last week was the big summer sale, and it was a fabulous sale. You guys kept me busy. I gave back a lot of money, and that's a good thing, because the sales are only advertised to uh, existing customers who have bought from the store, or to you guys who are on TubeLab, or girls, um, and it's, it's a way to say thank you to all of my great customers. So I've got $20 shipping around the world. And if yours is $150 or more after discount, the shipping's on me, folks. And there's a secret code that's always hiding. And the hint that I gave in the past is that if you follow the progression of the codes, it's easy to figure out what the secret code is. Okay, everyone, stay safe. This is Jim from Bells and More signing off. Cheers, everyone.